My name is Justine Renoy-Kam. I'm the junior curator of 16th and 17th century Dutch painting at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. First of all, a big thank you to the Royal Castle for the invitation to give a presentation related to the exhibition about Dutch 17th century art. As you know, the exhibition is called Rembrandt's World, and one of the objectives is to get a feeling of the world in which 17th century Dutch art was made. To stay within this theme, I'm going to discuss three examples of Dutch 17th century cityscapes in which artists painted their own hometown and therefore truly offered us a view inside their world. But first, a short introduction to the genre of cityscapes. In the Dutch Republic, painted cityscapes were made for many different reasons and can be found in many different forms. Already in the centuries before, cities had occasionally inspired painters from the Low Countries, especially as a backdrop to religious scenes or portraits. For instance, on this panel, painted in 1480. We can see the main scene is Christ before Pilate, but in the background, we can spot the city square of Haarlem in the Netherlands. Early examples of depicted cities can also be found on maps and on accompanying illustrations to printed descriptions of cities. The autonomous painted cityscape, in which the city really acts as the main subject of the painting, is a specialism that developed relatively late and really only matured in the second half of the 17th century. In terms of quantity, the cityscape is quite a small genre. 17th century Dutch artists, for example, painted much more landscapes and portraits and history paintings. There are some artists who are undeniably specialists of the genre, such as the brothers Job and Gerrit Berkheide. Here, we see a view of Amsterdam by Gerrit Berkheide. Due to the enormous increase of its population, Amsterdam had to expand during the 17th century. Here we see an accurate depiction of a canal, the Heerengracht, under construction, with a few lots still empty. This particular section of the canal became the domain of very rich inhabitants of Amsterdam. Another important name in cityscape painting is Jan van der Heide. He would often base his views of cities on existing buildings mixed with his own imagination, as is the case here with this fantasy view of a drawbridge based on actual sites in Amsterdam. The figures were painted by his colleague Adrian van der Velde. There are specialists of cityscapes, but the genre is interesting for the fact that far more than once, artists who distinctively specialize in a different genre will have painted a couple of wonderful cityscapes. This is true for all three examples that will be discussed today. The first example is Pieter Sangerdam's view of Asse Delft. We see the small village of Asse Delft in the province of North Holland, above Haarlem and Amsterdam. I've included this painting in my survey because it is a very rare and early example of a non-narrative view of an artist's hometown. During his career, Pieter Sangerdam almost exclusively painted church interiors, and while artists before Sangerdam mostly painted fantasy churches, he always meticulously relied on existing buildings. He worked after life, as he himself wrote on his drawings. He would make sketches and ground plans and measure all kinds of architectural elements while precisely following the rules of central perspective. The popularity of Peter Sangerdam's church interiors increased enormously in the 20th century. And he's quite well known for these wonderful pale church interiors with their impressive compositions and incredible use of light. But occasionally, Saradon was also interested in exteriors. In his view of Asadelf, we see a calm view of the town with inhabitants going about their daily activities on an ordinary sunny day. A woman is washing clothes on the river bank. A mother and child are walking together. Um, and altogether, just a very peaceful view of a town. Dated 1634, this is one of the earliest non-narrative depictions of a Dutch town seen up close. Saradam was far ahead of his time in this. And for instance, the earlier mentioned brothers Berkheide and Jan van der Heide only specialized in this more than a generation later, in the third quarter of the 17th century. It is safe to say that this is an accurate depiction of what Delft looked like at the time based partly on Sangram's habit of painting his compositions very true to life. 
This must have been an intimate painting for the artist. Zaradam's family was closely involved in local governance in Assedelft. His father, Jan Zaradam, who was also an artist and is well known for his engravings, was a church elder there. And his great uncle had been the schout, or the sheriff in Assedelft. On the painting, we see the rechthuis, or courthouse. The tall post to the right of the entrance has a bit of a gruesome purpose and was used to tie criminals for public floggings. Beyond, we see the St. Adolphus Church. Zaradam also painted the interior of this church. His father was buried there, and Peter Zaradam added the special personal details of his father's gravestone in the right foreground of the painting. Perhaps the most interesting detail of Peter Zaradam's view of Ostdelft is as was researched by art historians Martian Book and Gary Schwartz, the depiction of his family house to the left with the brick chimney. This was in fact the birthplace of the artist. Peter Saradam's view of Ossedelf therefore truly is an intimate and highly personal visual account of the world in which he spent his childhood. The second example of an artist painting his hometown that I would like to discuss is this view of Haarlem with bleaching grounds by Jacob van Ruisdaal from the Mauritshuis in The Hague. In the foreground, we see long lengths of linen bleaching in the sun. In the distance, we see the skyline of Haarlem, easily recognizable by the high roof of the St. Babos Church. The low horizon allows for an immense sky with clouds drifting by. We, as the spectators, are placed on a high dune. The Haarlem linen industry, which was incredibly successful, relied on the pure June water to wash and treat the linen. Jacob van Ruysta was born in Haarlem into an artistic environment. His father, Isaac, was a frame maker, art dealer, and a talented but little known painter. His uncle Salomon was a prominent Haarlem artist, particularly known for his river landscapes. Jacob himself grew up to be one of the most versatile 17th century Dutch landscape painters. His landscapes are characterized by an exceptional diversity of subjects and astonishing craftsmanship. And to tell you the truth, if you would show me this painting for the first time and ask me what genre it belonged to, I would probably answer landscape and not cityscape. The vast majority of the painting consists of landscape and sky with the panoramic view of the city pushed to the background. And it was made by Jan van Ruisdaal, who left a varied oeuvre, including um, for instance, seascapes, but who still undeniably remains an artist specialized in landscape painting. However, already in the 17th century, this particular type of painting by Ruisdaal was known as a Haarlempje, meaning Little Haarlem, and can be found in inventories under this title. The fact that we see Haarlem and the strong association of this particular city with the linen industry is therefore at the core of the painting. It also shows how classifications by genre can often be quite blurred. Jacob van Ruysdaal's Haarlemtjes were very popular already in the 17th century. We know of at least 15 versions of this painting by his hand, such as this similar version at the Rijksmuseum. The composition was also used by followers of Jacob van Ruysdaal, such as Jan van Kessel. And in the current exhibition at the Royal Castle, a version of a Haarlemtje by van Kessel is on view in which you can only just make out St. Bavo's church in the distance. Van Ruysdaal painted his Haarlempjes in the second half of the 17th century, but the motif of a panoramic view of a city in the distance had been around for quite some time. It derives from maps and the cartographic tradition and was adopted in paintings already in the early 17th century by Hendrik Vroom, who is the pioneer of marine painting. Here, for instance, we see a panoramic stretch view of Horn in the distance. Now, where Saardam was an absolute maniac for documentation, with drawings and paintings that were very true to life, this is not the case for Ruisdaal's work at all. Fantasy and reality merge together in his paintings. For example, he painted more than a dozen pictures of Bentheim Castle, a castle which can still be admired in the German border region. Ruisdaal set the castle in a different mountain landscape several times. 
For instance, in this version, the castle makes a more imposing impression than it does in real life, and such high mountains are not found there. Van Ruysta also took some liberties with his Haarlem place. As curator of the Mauritshuis Ariane van Suchtle writes, Van Ruysta never depicts exactly the right amount of windows for St. Pavel's church. In the version now at the Kunsthaus in Zürich, Van Ruysta even included an entirely made up lake in the foreground. In these popular depictions of his birth town, the artist was clearly more interested in light and composition than in topographical accuracy. Even the most concise survey of artists who painted their own hometown is incomplete without discussing Johannes Vermeer, one of today's most celebrated Dutch 17th century masters. I would therefore like to conclude with Vermeer's world famous painting known as The Little Street. We see a scene of everyday life in Vermeer's hometown of Delft, where he lived and worked until his death in 1675. In the little streets, Vermeer painted a row of ordinary houses. Two children are playing outside, while women are engaged in household work. Over the years, many scholars have addressed the question where exactly in Delft these houses stood. And only recently, through new archival research, was Dutch professor Frans Grijzehout able to convincingly identify the location as the Vlamingstraat 40 and 42. Grijzehout compared the composition to a 17th century document recording the width of houses for text purposes. Vermeer also had a personal connection to this address, since his widowed aunt, Ariane van Klaas, lived in the house to the right with her children from around 1645 until her death in 1670. Vermeer created an almost photographic realism in the little street. By adding the alleyway and the houses in the distance, he adds depth to the painting. He inventively cuts off the picture plane and sort of crops the image in a very modern way. He also successfully creates the illusion of an accurate depiction of materials with rough bricks above the smoother whitewashed section of the facade. However, Vermeer doesn't achieve this lifelike effect through minutely detailed brushwork. In fact, up close, the bricks consist of overlapping shades of brown and red, with loose strokes and splodges of grey and white. This really reveals Vermeer's deep understanding of lightfall and how we perceive objects. The Little Street is an unusual painting in Vermeer's small oeuvre of circa 35 paintings. The majority of his work consists of intimate paintings of interiors, in which the main subject, often a woman, is engaged in an everyday activity, often in the light of a nearby window. From an early seal catalogue of Vermeer's work, it is known that he painted at least three cityscapes. One is the little street. The second is his exquisite view of Delft at the Mallet's house, again of his hometown. And then the whereabouts of the third street are unknown. We only know it existed thanks to this, the text in the 17th century auction catalogue. So by all means, check your attics and, and keep an eye out for, uh, for his missing uh, cityscape, I'd say. When I think about Vermeer's world, I think about the fact that he lived with his wife and 11 children in the house of his mother-in-law. Even though there is no particular evidence to support this, you can't help but think that Vermeer did not often get the chance to experience the peaceful tranquility himself that is so present in his paintings. And that's the thing with these paintings of cityscapes and the notion of a depicted world of the artist. Some painters dedicated themselves to creating true to life depictions of what they saw, such as Pieter Saarland and Gerrit Berkheide. Others like Jacob van Ruijstaal and Jan van der Heide actively used their fantasy in the renderings of cities. It's a diverse genre filled with paintings of artists who carefully chose locations and vantage points Sometimes cityscapes can make you feel as if you're almost a tourist in the Dutch Republic and really are in the world of the artist, even if they are partly or even completely derived from their imagination. I hope I was able to bring across a glimpse of this feeling today. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it and wish you a very pleasant visit to the exhibition at the Royal Castle. Bye-bye.